Soren Kaplan, welcome to the conversation today. Nice to be here, John. It is a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from the Seattle area. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about experiential intelligence, or XQ. We're going to explore what that really means and then talk about it in relation to leadership teams and developing a strong, healthy organizational culture. As we get started, I wanted to share Soren's bio with everybody. Soren Kaplan has been named one of the world's top management experts and consultants by Thinkers 50 and Business Insider. He is a columnist for both Inc. Magazine and Psychology Today, where he focuses on how to build high-performing, resilient, and innovative teams and organizational cultures. That's just a snippet. I could go on and on, but I'm going to pause there. Anything you would like to highlight by way of your background, personal context before we dive on in? Only that uh, I have worked globally around the world with tens of thousands of leaders uh, trying to understand what allows for disruptive leadership in terms of disrupting mm -hmm. yourself so you can disrupt the market from a business angle. Um, and then on the personal side, you know, I've had the professional experiences, but I've also, you know, had a lot of personal experiences that have kind of led me to write the book that I just wrote and um, identify how important experience itself is in becoming that third leg of the intelligence stool that we'll we'll talk about. Yeah, well, great. And wh why don't we begin there? And you just mentioned the the three legs of the intelligence stool we often talk about iq eq what exactly do you mean by experiential intelligence why is it important and how does it complement iq and eq we've known for a long time iq is important and we have tests to measure it then we learned emotional intelligence or eq is important which basically means being in touch with our own emotions and the emotions of other people and in today's world where things are changing faster than ever, you have technology disruption, you have artificial intelligence, you've mm -hmm. got uh, a whole host of changes happening around us. Intellect and emotions aren't sufficient. We need to understand how have the experiences that we've had growing up and in life and in business shaped us and given us assets that might be hidden and also be able to see other people's assets experiences that they might not necessarily be able to articulate, but that really yeah. fundamental to, to success. And that's really what experiential intelligence is all about. Yeah. So, so tapping into our past experience, understanding our experience and the ex experiences of others, helping everyone. I mean, as you're saying that I'm thinking, oh, that kind of sounds like therapy. You know, you go, you, you sit on the couch, you talk to somebody and they help you unpack stuff from your past that maybe you haven't really spent time reflecting on. Um, I guess my question then would be, you know, outside of something like therapy, which I think probably most people can utilize, uh, to good effect. Um, how how would people go about, you know, uh, developing this this XQ awareness and ability? Uh, what what's some of those first steps? Yeah, that's it's a great question. So let me just ma make this clear what we're talking about. So let you know, how, John, how did you learn to ride a bike? What did you did you read the manual? Uh, no, no I think I hopped on and I tried. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So you know, when we learn to ride a bike, typically. You know, we, we might get help from someone. We might have training wheels. We'll be wobbly. Then maybe we'll take off a training wheel. We might fall over a little bit and then we really yeah. figure it out. So what's, let's unpack that for a second. So we, we learn the, the nuts and bolts of it. We learn how to steer and how to brake. And then perhaps as we get better, we get higher order abilities like how do we ride defensively in traffic mm -hmm. or how do we anticipate bumps in the road in, in the future? Now, those are higher order abilities we get. And then there's the mindsets around it. Well, what is a bike? Is it just transportation? Or is it about adventure? Or is it about socializing? How we d decide to look at a bike in relation to ourselves is also important in terms of what we do with it. So you've got mindsets, higher order abilities, and just base skills and knowledge. And those are the three elements of experiential intelligence. Now, let me just, you talked about kind of going deep. So let's let's go deep for a second. I can learn how to ride a bike and I can just do it. And I can decide, oh, this is just for transportation. And, and that can all be conscious. However, let's say I'm riding a bike and I fall over in front of my friends when I'm younger and I'm embarrassed or I get hurt. 
bike riding can become a threat to me, or it can become a source of rem a, a reminder of the shame I had in front of my friends. And then I might shy away from even wanting to ride a bike. And so there are these mindsets that can get in the way potentially based on our experiences as an inhibitor of great leadership, of innovation, of you know teamwork, of risk-taking, or we can be more conscious of what went into the, those experiences so we can either overcome the limiters or really lean into and leverage those strengths that we gained from whatever those experiences are, just like riding a bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And right now I, I have uh, four teenage daughters and I have one that you know has been working on her permit and just got her license. And so we're past the bike riding stage, uh, but we're to you know, the, those higher order skills like you're talking about. Uh, versus, you know, when I first uh, take my daughter to the parking lot after she gets her permit and starts, you know, I just start to do the b very basic things, uh, very much relevant to what you were just describing. And the reality is we all have those things, right, in, in our everyday lives, um, you know, for, for kids developing, maybe a bike or a teenager, it might be a car. Uh, as you get older, though, there's all sorts of skills that we have experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly with. And uh, how we make sense of those and uh, leverage them will make a big difference in how effective and productive we're going to be moving forward. Yeah, and we're, we'll tie this into business and organizations and leadership, but even as a parent or as a coach or as a teacher, if we're aware that those experiences that, uh, that those were supporting are impacting them at those different three different levels all the time, we can help people understand what did this, how did this experience impacted, impact me? Yeah. How do I yeah. process it? Do I look at this as a threat in the future or do I look at this as learned something I learned and gained some assets from and how do I then leverage that in the future? And so it, a lot of it's about framing, a lot of it's a, a, about processing in real time so that we can, you know, use whatever those experiences are as a springboard for where we want to go rather than something mm -hmm. to overcome through therapy or something else uh, down the line. Yeah. And, and so part of this is, you know, if, if I'm individually trying to leverage my experience or, or help others around me on my team to do the same, it, it requires a good amount of self-reflective practice, right? Um, to be able to consider. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, from your experience, from your research and working with, uh, you know, industry professionals from around the world, you know, what, what are some of those best practices in developing that kind of self-reflective mindset and toolkit uh, so that we can leverage these experiences. Yeah, there, there's a lot of research ar around mindsets, around um, how um, trauma works. And and I'm not going to kind of go into that right now, but I'll give you a quick example because it's pretty simple. Um, I worked with a Fortune 1000 company, brought a team together that post-COVID hadn't worked a lot together. Um, and we it, it was a lot of new players on the team. So we did a simple exercise. We basically had people come into the room ready to share. Here are three experiences that really shaped me and gave me some assets that I can now contribute to this team moving forward. And we didn't say it had to be works work oriented. And a lot of people were bringing in things that were just about their life experience places. You know, they had lived internationally or they had, you know, gone on some kind of a, a trip or they had, you know, learned something from a mentor that, you know, outside of work and the incredible level of vulnerable depth of sharing surfaced these competencies and capabilities and skills and mindsets of this team that people wouldn't have known otherwise if they had just gotten together and, you know, kind of at a surface level, just said, you know, what's on my resume that I'm going to contribute. And so that, that's, that was just a very simple example. And this team then used those, those key competencies and then said, how do we execute on our strategy this year? Um, so it was very tangible. Another quick example um, from a, a leadership angle, uh, I've worked with uh, someone who uh, she was the internet, she received uh, the top 40 chief marketing officer award from Forbes magazine for her work mm -hmm. as uh, head of marketing at Hershey. Um, and I asked her, I said, you know, I, we talked about experiential intelligence and I said, give me an example of something that, that led you to this great success outside of going to business school and your work experience. And she said, oh, that's easy. Um, I play the violin. 
And I, mm-hmm. I said, well, what do you mean? And she said basically that she had to learn to play in an uh, orchestra. She had to have intense focus and get really good herself, but know when to step in and step back in her orchestra. And she also had to write, you know, she was co- a composer. So she was creative and wrote, wrote music. And she said, those are the same skills as a leader at Hershey running international business that she needed to step in and then step back and let teams run with things. She needed to have intense focus and make sure the execution was there, but they also had to be creative and come up with new products for the international market that were different from the US. And so she was able to, at least this individual leader could had a line of sight to those personal experiences and the skills and mindsets they develop and then how they translate to leadership. And then we talked about how she can then find that in her team members also and how to uncover that. Cause not everybody comes to the table you know, with a real solid awareness of the the experiences they've had outside of work and how they can contribute inside of work. Yeah, yeah. Well, and as you were describing that experience, uh, the, you know, that uh, woman's, that leader's experience, I'm thinking this is just further indication to me that we spend far too much time, you know, in organizations thinking about someone's educational pedigree or someone's, um, you know, where they've kind of moved up the hierarchy in a particular uh, set of roles or, uh, you know, a, a certain career path. Like if if we can learn to leverage experience better, there can be so many potential pathways to, to future leadership opportunities uh, because we can recognize when someone has the skill sets, the mindsets that are going to help them to be successful, whether They have, you know, all the experience that someone else has in sales specifically or in, you know, name the name, the function right now. There are technical skills you need to develop to be successful in a lot of different types of positions. But a lot of times there's transferable skill sets that come from the experiences that we have. And I think often we shortchange them when we're considering people for potential leadership positions. And there's huge implications for recruiting and talent Mm -hmm. management and leadership development and staffing your innovation teams. And there's giant implications for that. And then you look at what you just said, and then the trajectory of what people, and this is, I think, in part because of the pandemic and COVID, a lot of younger people under 30 no longer see a college degree as right. that you know, lever, you know, kind of tried and true lever for success. Um, uh, it's less than 50% see it as extremely important anymore. And so you have, you know, kind of a recognition that having experiences can lead to six quote unquote success in other areas. And then you see big companies like Google and others creating certificates and other types of alternative forms of experience that are oftentimes hands-on to bypass you know, what a lot of people are seeing now is a broken education system. So I, I think we're going to see more and more recognition uh, that experience is really a lever and an important one, and that we need to understand it more broadly than you know, what's on our resumes. Um, and, and that's really a key to success in teams, individually, and mm-hmm. and, and even in life, uh, it, being aware of that. Yeah. So if, if as a leader, I understand the importance of XQ. I, I try to practice regular self-reflection. I try to model, the, you know, leveraging my own past experiences towards my future performance and success. If, if I can do that, and then, and then I can work with my team uh, to help them develop similar mindsets and to do some of the types of things, um, you know, that we've been talking about. Uh, what have you seen from research and from your your practitioner work um, you know, what are those impacts on teams uh, as they, you know, organizations want to innovate, they want to create, they want to add value to the market. Um, how does XQ connect with those desires and those outcomes? Yeah, there, this is much, this this has as much to do with business results as it does with sort of the the human potential that we all have. So from a business results standpoint, if you understand and draw out the experiences of people on your team 
you get a, a, a greater you get greater vulnerability typically in your team. You get greater understanding of the a- individual assets that people are bringing to the party, and you can leverage those. So you are upping the competency of your team overall in achieving its business goals. If you do that organizationally and you identify those individuals, uh, first off, who have had um, great careers and experiences that can be shared, you're really leveraging the the best practice, the informal knowledge oftentimes of the organization. So you're surfacing competencies that might go untapped. But then if you're doing that in a more broad-based way too, and you just have a recognition that people's experiences give, create assets, you then start to create a culture in your organization also that values the whole person in from the standpoint of whatever their experiences are, how do we value what they could potentially provide and develop and draw that out in benefit and service of the organization's business strategy and vision. So do you start to cr- you start to change culture with this type of a approach as well? Yeah, I think so. And again, referring back to what we were just talking about a minute ago and, and how it contributes to culture, you know, I'm thinking about the traditional hierarchical organization and the traditional succession planning and career pathways and go to high school, go to college, maybe graduate school, you come into the organization, you work your way up. And we know that for decades, that has slowly been eroding. And and there's a different reality, certainly today, than there was for my parents' generation or their parents' generation. People are switching not only organizations, but entire careers multiple times throughout their work life. Um, So the idea that you're going to go work for one organization for a really long time is almost a bit silly. And frankly, younger um, younger workers, mil- young millennials and Gen Z workers, like the whole notion of even working for the same organization for the rest of their lives sounds so abhorrent. <laughs> That's not even something they want to explore, you know. So recognizing these kinds of shifts and the the psychological contract of work and how that's ebbed and flowed over time, I think is is an important piece of this. And organizations are struggling to attract and retain really great people, right? Uh, And we know if you're not attracting and retaining great people, it's going to be hard to have a really dynamic team, a dynamic team culture, because people want to work with other, you know, good people want to work with other good people. They want to have good resources to grow and develop continually. Um, And they want to be able to leverage, you know, what they've done in the past towards future successes. And so what organizations are waking up to more and more, and you've already pointed to, there are definitely examples of organizations that have been doing this for a while, is we we need to get out of our own way. Like we have to get out of our own way around these rigid structures that we put in place that we we say, you know, in order for someone to be successful in this job, they need to have a college degree and five years experience, you know, doing X, Y, Z or whatever. There may be instances where those kinds of requirements are necessary, but a lot of times I think it's just an artifact of the past and it, it doesn't really serve us all that well now. And so we're we're leaving talent on the table, like we're literally losing good people because they don't have a way to progress in the organization um, in, a, in, in a way that's meaningful to them uh, because they're stuck on like kind of one rigid career pathway and there's only so much opportunity for advancement in that rigid career pathway. But if, if organizations can recognize how to leverage, better leverage the experiences of these people in perhaps diverse ways in other parts of the business, then it, it's, it solves our retention problem. It solves the labor shortage and skills gap problem. Uh, it helps with the cultural components of the teams. It, it just can help in so many ways. Um, and, and, and I get that more and more organizations are th- starting to think this way, but it seems like there's still a huge gap, you know, between kind of the, the traditional notions of, of career pathways versus you know, how we can leverage XQ into a, a more agile kind of a career future. I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Well, I completely agree with what you're saying. And then I would also highlight the fact that culture is created every day through people's experiences, meaning yeah. if we want to change our culture to more agile, to more innovation, we can create experiences intentionally to shape culture and give people whole new mindsets, abilities, and skill sets. And so just two quick examples. I've been doing 
some leadership development work with um, NBC Universal as well as Ascension Health, who bring their high potential leaders through a you know development program, but it's applied. It's it's basically taking business, real business challenges around technology and the market and changing customers and consumers and healthcare issues and whatever it may be, and saying, we want you to go out and in an agile way, give yourselves experiences based on design thinking or innovation or product development yeah. that forces a whole new kind of way of being in an organization because you have to dr drive innovation. And that's usually not like second nature to a lot of people who've been operators for a long time. And that experience changes people. That experience delivers real value at the same time back to the company. And then it sets the foundation for a more broader based culture because you've had this you know group of people who've all had this shared experience that have developed mindsets, abilities and know-how toward shaping the future. And then they go off in the organization. And so there, there's a lot of things we can do to shape experiences also more proactively to drive change. Yeah, that idea of shaping experiences proactively really resonates with me. Uh, and again, I think this is one, I think most people recognize, yeah, I need to give people stretch assignments and give them opportunities to grow. And I need to develop the bench strength of my team. And like, these are kind of the notions that I hear people talk about a lot. So it's good that at least it's in the awareness of people collectively, but in reality, you know, when, when you're in the daily grind, you know, so many leaders are kind of running around like chickens with their heads cut off, just putting out fires all the time. Um, and it's, it's just very, very easy to lose sight of that kind of overarching goal to develop your people uh, and to, you know, in strategic ways, think about how am I going to give these uh, team members new, interesting experiences that can be leveraged, not only to help us now, but to help us, you know, six months from now, a year from now, five years from now, um, by developing that bench strength and helping them develop those skills, uh, helping them think critically about the experiences while they're having them too. Because, you know, I, I think so many people don't take the time to stop and reflect. And so even though they're having a tremendous experience um, working with a multifunctional team, you know, diverse backgrounds and perspectives, like so much that can be learned from that. But if you just get so caught up in the weeds of doing the work itself without taking time to really uh, step back and, and, and reflect, then you're probably going to leave a lot of the potential learnings on the table and not you're not going to get as much out of that experience as, as you otherwise would have. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think that that life is just a collection of experiences. And so the more we can be self-aware of the experiences that we're having, whether it's in life or work, and then decipher those along the way and work with yeah. them to understand what are they giving to us and what are we creating for other people? We are all just more conscious and more you know able to yeah. achieve the things we want to achieve. Yeah, well said. Well, Sora, and this has just been a really great conversation. I know at the time I need to let you go here in just a minute, but before we wrap things up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Uh, pretty simple to find me. It's uh, my first name, last name.com, Soren, S-O-R-E-N-K-A-P-L-A-N.com, SorenKaplan.com. Um, and the, the last word is, I, I think I sort of said it, you know, we all have experiences. Sometimes they get in our way. Sometimes they're enablers. The opportunity for us in today's disruptive world is to understand ourselves better, help other people understand themselves mm -hmm. better, and then work together to, you know, collaborate in a way that that kind of takes one and one and, and makes it three. And that's really what leveraging experience is about and complementing your IQ and your EQ with your XQ or experiential intelligence. I want, I, I love it. Soren, wonderful. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. I encourage the audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Soren can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great day.